it's a great pleasure to, uh, to welcome uh, Jill back. Jill is currently at INDE, which is a national research institute in Spain. Regional, regional. Regional, I apologize. This, this thing's called civil war down there. I wouldn't want to see. Um, so Jill uh, is, is quite unique in that uh, she, she basically straddles between the, the, the field of verification and formal methods, as I call them, and computer security. You probably, if you have been in any of the big conferences in, in any of these topics, security, cryptography, um, you have seen his work. He has done work across uh, privacy and verification, etc. And today he will give us an overview of, of this field and talk about language-based techniques for cryptography and privacy. Okay, so um, thanks very much for this uh, very long uh, introduction. Uh, and uh, so thanks for inviting me here. Uh, I hope you won't uh, freeze uh, during the talk, so good luck to all of you. I will try to move a bit. And uh, okay, so uh, what I will try to uh, uh, present today is a kind of um, work which uh, I've been uh, doing with a number of uh, people for the last 12 years or so. And uh, a lot of this work was done uh, with uh, my uh, former colleagues at Inria Sofia Antipolis, where I used to be when I started this work. And uh, so uh, before um, doing uh, application of formal methods to security, programming language, and so on, I was actually kind of brought up as a type theorist. And um, then when I got uh, kind of interested in trying to uh, look more at programming language and verification. There were, there was, so it was about 15 years ago and there was this kind of uh, a big divide between uh, uh, type systems and logic and uh, essentially uh, the basic idea there was like the type systems are uh, kind of uh, very scalable methods which are built on automation and uh, they can actually be used to verify safety and security properties. And so I was uh, kind of uh, initially very attracted to uh, type systems. But uh, as uh, time kind of uh, evolved, um, I uh, actually uh, did much more work in trying to apply uh, logical methods uh, to uh, verify properties of software. So initially, uh, one of the main appeal for uh, looking at logic is like you're not necessarily restricted a priori to a given class of uh, property. And also, if you really try to uh, verify very complicated properties, such as the one that arise in privacy or uh, cryptography, uh, you will really need to be both very precise and possibly at some point uh, to be uh, interactive. Of course, I mean, this uh, traditional view is uh, kind of uh, getting uh, blood. There has been a lot of work on SMT solvers, for example, uh, which has uh, helped uh, making uh, logic uh, very efficiently automated. And there has been also a lot of work in trying to develop logic-based methods for security, which is actually kind of the main topics on my talk. And uh, on the other direction, there has been also a lot of, uh, a lot of work in the area of uh, programming languages in uh, trying to make um, types uh, much more expressive. And I've done a little bit of work in this direction, but uh, I will not be really talking too much about this today. Okay, so uh, the high level uh, kind of uh, thrust of work which we've been developing is really trying to develop logic-based methods to uh, analyze uh, security. And so we'll be starting with some uh, very simple setup and uh, going to more kind of uh, general property and maybe some kind of unifying line of work. And what I will be uh, presenting is like I will be looking at one kind of properties which is called to safety, which I will explain in a moment, which is kind of very well suited for security and uh, is uh, slightly more general than what I've been considering the uh, previous literature. Okay, so to start with a very uh, simple uh, setup, which is the one which actually uh, I started to be interested in uh, when I started to look at security. There was a lot of emphasis on language-based security, and there is this baseline policy that people were considering, which is called uh, information flow security. And the basic idea here is like uh, you have a program, and your program is manipulating secrets, and you don't want uh, secrets to be leaked uh, through execution. 
I'm usually very good at coding during my talk, so we just remove this to try to fix that. And so the uh, kind of uh, uh, initial way people have been developing to uh, enforce non-interference is a type system, okay? And uh, so um, the basic idea, so if you look at the property of non-interference, essentially what you're doing is that like you are considering two execution of the same program. So I'm using a big step operational semantics there. So I have a program C. Think about it as a program written in a simple imperative language, although it doesn't really matter uh, for the purpose of the definition. And you start with some initial memory M1, and you're going to execute the program, and the program terminates with final memory M1, prime and you've got a second execution starting with memory M2, and terminating with final memory M2. And what you want is like if your two initial memory are uh, low equivalent, which means that they co consider in their public values, then uh, the final memories are also low equivalent, which again means they coincide in their public value. So it means that uh, if you have non-interference, you don't really have any leakage from secret input to public outputs, okay? And the way you're going to enforce this with a type system is essentially uh, trying to prevent two things. So there is the rule for assignment on the left, and the rule for assignment is actually designed to prevent something which is called a direct flow. And the direct flow is when you copy a private uh, value into a public variable, okay? So somebody who can read the public variable is going to be able to read the secret or part of the secret which is embedded in the expression you're assigning to. And the second rule, which is for conditional, and there is a similar rule for loops, is actually designed to prevent something called indirect flow. And indirect flow is uh, something which arises when actually uh, the control flow is kind of used to leak some information. And so one way to leak information uh, through control flow is when you test on a secret and you do different assignment according to the result of the test. And what the typing rule here for uh, conditional statement is ensuring is that it does not happen. So uh, there is a notion of type for tall command and a notion of type for, for expression and things are set up in such a way that the uh, indirect flow don't happen. And uh, so this type system is actually sound, but it has a number of defects. The first one is that it's actually uh, conservative in the sense that there are programs that are secure and uh, they won't be typable. So this is a kind of standard trade-off when you define a type system is like normally if you want to achieve uh, very high uh, efficiency and scalability, uh, you have to pay uh, in precision and uh, you end up having programs that satisfy your property that will be rejected by the type system. The other more complicated problem is that uh, actually uh, non-interference is a baseline uh, security policy and if you really want to look at interesting programs, you will have to consider other policy like declassification. And uh, actually extending type system to handle declassification has been done many times. There is actually a survey on declassification which has been written by Andre Sabelfeld and maybe Dave Sands and they have a huge map of all the approaches that have been taken and so on. But it's not super satisfactory what is available there. Okay, so kind of extending the scope of information flow type system to these more expressive policies uh, is a very big problem. And on the other hand, there is a very simple solution based on logic, which is called self-composition. And the basic idea of self-composition is that if you want to enforce uh, information flow policy of a program, what you will do is you will build a different program and verify a safety property on this different program. And this different program here is uh, it's self-composition. So you start with a program C and you make two copies of it. In one copy, you will tag all variable with a one. In the other copy, you will tag all variable with a two. Okay, so this gives you two programs, C1 and C2. And now because you have tagged variable in this way, the two programs, they actually operate on this joint part of the memory. So when you do that, take the sequential composition, actually what you will have is a program that emulates the effects of two executions. And then on the only thing you have to do uh, to uh, achieve non-interference is you have to say, okay, assume I start with uh, two memories which are low equivalent, 
and this is actually uh, captured by the logic for a person here which says like for each low variable the value of x in the first memory is equal to the value of x in the second memory and when I execute the program okay, and if the program terminates this assertion will remain valid okay so that's a very simple IG and it has very nice uh, theoretical property in the sense that it is sound and relatively complete, which means that uh, if uh, your original program is non-interfering, if and only if your transforming program satisfies uh, this uh, property. Okay, I am also taking a notion of non-interference, which is called uh, termination insensitive non-interference. If you start to worry about termination, there are different things that will happen, but in the simpler setting, you have this kind of equivalence. And this is also very flexible. You can handle um, kind of the classification policy. So that's a first example where you see that uh, there is a very simple kind of logical approach uh, that is a very appealing and overcomes some of the defects of the type-based approach. Of course, the next question is how you're going to automate this. But first, um, this idea of self-composition actually has uh, given rise to um, a lot of work in this uh, area and uh, a lot of the work has also gone into setting up a definitional setting where you can actually uh, specify um, kind of security policy. So soon after we published our work on uh, self-composition, so that was 2004, there was a follow-up work by um, um, Terochi and Icon where they actually introduced the notion of two safety and the notion of two safety, as you see uh, written on top of my slides, is also, again, assuming you have two terminating execution of a program and that the initial memory are related by uh, some uh, relation phi, and you want to make sure that the uh, final memory are related by some relation psi. Okay, so that's a generalization of non-interference where the requirements on the initial memory and on the final memory, instead of being low equivalence, they can be arbitrary relation on memory. And that's a very uh, interesting class of property to look at, both because it encompasses uh, a definition from security, but it has also application in many other settings. For, for example, if you work on cyber physical system, you will be very much interested in your uh, kind of uh, system being robust, but by which I mean that if you do some small changes in the input, you get measure uh, impact on the output. Okay, so that's a notion of continuity. And one way uh, to model continuity of CPS system is to use this notion of uh, Lipschitz continuity, which essentially says that for any two input, you can bound uh, the distance between the output by uh, a factor k, which is fixed, times the distance between the input. Okay, and there has been a lot of work in uh, trying to automatically verify Lipschitz continuity of programs. There are also probabilistic notions uh, that come from cryptography and differential privacy. Uh, one notion is indistinguishability. And so indistinguishability is uh, actually at a very high level uh, trying to bound the statistical distance between uh, two probabilistic computation. So there is a notion of uh, efficient adversary, uh, but uh, forget about this for now. What you are just trying to bound is the distance between two distributions. Uh, differential privacy is actually a similar notion, uh, except you use a slightly different notion of distance, which is written here as a delta epsilon, and we'll see uh, what it means later on in the talk. And uh, this is not verified for all inputs, pairs of inputs, but for all, for all pairs of inputs that uh, satisfy uh, some adjacency relations. So if there are databases, uh, two databases is, is are adjacent if they only differ in one of their entries. And uh, another very interesting notion, there was a big moment of excitement for me around 2014 when we actually uh, found out that the notion used in game theory such as truthfulness, they can actually be modeled as to safety. And so the idea of truthfulness is like you will be running the program twice, except this time the program which you are running is kind of a program where you have strategic agents and the agents are going to pr provide some inputs. Okay, and uh, they are kind of free to cheat 
uh, in order to try to maximize their payoff. And the notion of truthfulness is actually just saying, well, uh, there is no benefit for you in cheating. If you actually provide the right value, uh, this is what will maximize your payoff. So this is actually what this content theory is saying. Okay? So you have two runs, and in the second run, the agent B2 is actually providing the right value, and you see that this payoff is being maximized. Okay? And uh, so it's a class of property that was introduced recently, but is really covering a lot of very natural properties that have application in different settings. And uh, there has been a lot of work on uh, kind of applications of two safety. Uh, there has been work on trying to prove a program equivalence. But there's also been a lot of work by people at uh, Microsoft Research and some other places in kind of uh, doing verification, modular version, semantic difference. So the idea here is like you have a system and your system evolves. And your system is huge. You're not going to be able to verify the system. But what you want to verify is like which kind of impact small changes on the system have. And this is where you can actually do this differential verification because you can just focus on the changes and try to analyze what's going on there. Okay, and uh, there's also a lot of work on the differential static analysis. Um, yes, so it, I mean a lot of the work actually took place at uh, MSR Redmond and there are people like uh, Logos, Logos or Hoblitz well um, that have been working and um, um, Lahiri. So, I mean, there's a lot of work. There have been a lot of work as well on doing kind of uh, uh, verifying to safety, model checking, and things like this. I can give you some pointers if you like later, but I will not talk about this. What I will do instead is uh, try to um, uh, talk about the deductive methods for uh, doing um, uh, program verification of these two safety. And so, although uh, uh, self-composition has been uh, widely used. My personal view on it uh, is that it's not always practical. And uh, one of the reasons it's not really practical is like assume you have one very big program and what you're going to do is you're going to make two copies of it and you're going to put them next to each other. And when you're going to try to do verification, maybe you have a very complicated loop here and you have to say something about how this very complicated loop compares to this very complicated loop here, which is kind of the same loop, but is very, very far away. And that makes things very messy from the point of view of verification. And uh, so there, it turns out that there are other approaches that can be developed based on the same principle. And in fact, there is a class of construction, which are called product programs. And what these product programs, they actually do, they take two programs and they build a single program that emulates the behavior of the two programs. Okay, and there are ways to do it in a more or less synchronous way. So what I'm presenting here on this slide is actually a notion of which is called cross product, a synchronous product program, where what you actually try to do is like you try to have the two programs that you're trying to build a product for that execute in lockstep. And so the basic idea here is like you will be using some after statement to check, to check every time you have a control flow uh, point uh, whether the two programs actually follow the same control flow. So if you look at the rule here for if then else, you have two if then else statements and uh, what you're going to do is uh, like you're going to try to build a product and the first thing the product is going to do is it's going to check whether the two conditions are equivalent and so if the two conditions are equivalent what you will do is like uh, you will uh, the product will be an if then else statement where the true branch is actually a product of the two branch of the uh, two programs, and the false branch will have to be the product of the two false branch of the program. Okay. So this is how you ensure that um, the two programs execute in lockstep, and if they don't execute in lockstep, actually the execution will raise an asset failure. Okay. And uh, so what are the applications? Well, there are actually two applications. Uh, the original application for cross product, which was introduced by the way by um, Snowelli and Zacks in uh, 2008, was a translation validation. So you actually wanted to prove that a particular program op optimization applied to a specific program is a program which is equivalent. Okay, and uh, so the cross product uh, construction allows you to do this. Um, 
more recently, together with uh, some of my former students, we've actually extended uh, the notion of product program to deal with loop optimization, and we can actually handle a lot, a lot of loop optimization. But for me, the nicest and most unexpected application of a product program is uh, analysis of side channel in crypto implementation. So uh, if you're going to attack a crypto implementation, one thing which you like is like break all the rules of the game. And one way to break the rule of the game is actually do all kind of measurement, uh, which give you some information and try to use this information to recover <coughs> secrets. Okay, and uh, so uh, a way of attacking uh, crypto implementation is for example, by measuring their execution time. And it might look silly, but actually by measuring the execution time, very often you are able to recover the key. Okay, and there has been a lot of attacks. Uh, for example, uh, LFT 13, cash bleed. These are just uh, some random one, but really if you uh, follow what's going on on the crypto ePrint, you will see like every two months there is an attack being published that exploits uh, execution time. And so to find this, uh, there was a proposal by Dan Bernstein around 2005 um, to write program that are, yes? Constant time. Okay, so constant time uh, is not actually that there is a timing model, but what it actually means is like you will not branch on secret and you will not access arrays using secret indices. Maybe you want to. It depends how you set things up. Like uh, the way we set things up is like actually execution across a rated uh, kind of assessment framework is very divergent. So in this sense, it's fine. And if you set up some other way, then that would not work. Okay, so. Uh, <coughs> this is the notion of constant time and it looks like a pretty naive solution, but I trust like people like Dan Bernstein and Peter Schwabe and the people who actually implement the crypto library uh, have a good judgment of what has to be done to avoid uh, these timing leaks and that's the way they implement their stuff. And it actually seems that it's uh, protected against these cache attacks. Now, you might think it's a very simple policy and then it's very easy to implement. In fact, it's not so easy uh, to write implementations that are constant time. So as I mentioned, every two months, there is a kind of implementation that is broken. We had a very funny uh, kind of um, occurrence in uh, trying to uh, look at um, the Amazon web service implementation of uh, uh, TLS. So we were looking at it and uh, we actually found that there was a timing attack and then we contacted the people at Amazon and said, no, no, you know, the attack has already been found. And it turned out that there were uh, people uh, like at uh, Royal Holloway who had found an attack. But uh, actually, uh, what we found is an attack of the patch of the attack. So it's uh, really like these guys, they really know what they're doing because they've been doing these uh, timing attacks for a long time and they can still get it wrong. Okay, so it's uh, really very hard. Uh, even if it looks very simple. And also because you have to look at, I mean, <laughs> this is a very low level property. You have to uh, kind of understand what the compiler is doing. There's a lot of reason why, why things can go wrong. So it would be nice to verify. Now you might think, oh, is it really easy to verify or not? Well, it, what actually happens is like this cross product, which I've been showing to you on the previous slide, is actually sound and complete for constant time. Okay, so you have this problem that people don't really know how to solve uh, to verify a policy which has been, uh, this constant time policy which has been proposed around 2005. And you can use a 2008 paper that already gives you a completely baked solution to it. And that's actually what we did. Actually, we did slightly more, but uh, using this uh, idea of cross product, we took a tool called SMAC, which is developed by Zvonimir um, 
I still don't know his name. So people were making fun of me last week at CAD because I didn't know his name, but I still don't. And Michael Emmy. And uh, so we used a SMAC tool, which is uh, operating at the level of the intermediate representation of LLVM. We kind of implemented this uh, cross product construction on this level there. And using this, we could analyze off the shelf implementation of crypto libraries. And we got like automated analysis of uh, 17,000 lines of code and uh, get uh, kind of uh, uh, no uh, false positive, no false negative. So it's a very uh, nice way to uh, verify constant time using a, again, a very simple logical construction. Okay. Now, uh, one of the problem with this product construction is like you have to build your product a priori, and that might be kind of difficult to know beforehand how you're going to build your product. And so there is another approach, which is relational whole logic. So relational whole logic was introduced by Nick Benton around 2004, and essentially what it does is like it takes whole logic and adapts it to a setting where you actually reason about two programs at the same time. Okay, and uh, so if you look at the rule here again, so uh, you have a precondition, which is actually a relation on memory. Okay, in whole logic, it's a predicate on memory. Here it's a relation on memory. And the post condition is also a relation on memory, and then you have two programs. And what I'm doing here is uh, I'm assuming that the two programs have different uh, variable, uh, different variables again, okay, so it like makes my life uh, more, comp uh, more simple because an assertion is essentially a search for the formula over the program variable of the first program and the program variable of the second program. And so here what I'm uh, having in this rule here is like assume that phi is my precondition and that the two gauss of the program are equivalent. Okay, and I want to lay the two with an L. And then what I have to do, because I know the two gods are equivalent, I just have uh, to compare the true graph of the first program with the true graph of the second program, which is what I'm doing here, under the assumption that the gods are valid. And the same for the false graph. Okay. And uh, so, uh, of course, if you know Nick Benton, it's like he, I think he was born, bred, grew up in Cambridge, so he speaks uh, very beautiful English and he writes paper very nicely, and he has uh, this uh, very nice quote which says, okay, looks uh, frighteningly simple-minded, and maybe you think it is, but it actually works really, really well. So it's a very beautiful kind of uh, construction. And uh, actually, uh, relational whole logic is uh, the basis of a lot of the stuff which we are doing, and uh, give you a lot of mileage. So one of the issues with this, uh, with relational whole logic, is really like, uh, Initially, in the way it was presented by Nick, it's kind of incomplete because it's assuming that you do the same, you have the same control flow, and this is something which you can actually overcome easily for uh, conditional, but for loop, it's more complicated. So the standard loop, rule for loop, was requiring that the two loops work in lockstep and make the same number of iteration. In uh, our tool, uh, we had an extension where we would allow that one loop executes completely uh, and then maybe the other loop executes co completely and then they have to maintain an invariant and you would be done. And uh, this is nice, but this is not ideal. And so this year we actually uh, came up with a new rule which looks uh, kind of uh, horrendous because it has probably about half a dozen or more than half a dozen premise. But what it, it essentially saying is like you have to consider three cases. Actually the real rule is slightly more complicated. But uh, what you have to do is like you have to consider the case where you do one iteration or you execute the body of the loop in lockstep. This case here where you do one iteration of the loop body and the other one is not moving. And this judgment here where you do one iteration of the loop body of the second program and the first one is not moving. Okay, and if you can actually establish this, then you have your while. Uh, condition to work with. And this is nice because it allows you to relate uh, programs which do different number of iterations. Okay, so for example, here it's just going to do n iteration and here n plus one, and this is something which you can do with. Now, relational whole logic gets very exciting when you start to make it probabilistic. So uh, in 2009, we had this proposal for a, a probabilistic relational whole logic. And so it looks very much like a relational whole logic, except that so it has a kind of 
same uh, um, form of judgment, the precondition and the postcondition are still uh, relation on memory, okay? But the two programs are probability. And so now, uh, what does it mean that uh, this judgment is valid? Because we start with two in initial memories that satisfy the precondition, and then you execute the two programs and you obtain two distributions. And you want these two distributions to be related by a postcondition. And uh, so there has been, uh, a w so first of all, when we tried to do this, we didn't save anything, and uh, it took us one year to try to come up with the right definition, and uh, we didn't really get the right definition until at some point we saw the light and uh, thought like, why don't we look at the literature? And uh, in fact, uh, we actually found that there was some work in probabilistic process algebra, which has a notion of listing, and so that definition of listing, actually what it does, it tries to take the relation uh, on A times B, and it turns it into a relation on this A times this B, and this is the set of distribution. And so the definition is given here, Okay, and uh, essentially what you have to do is write an existential statement if you want to uh, relate two distributions uh, by a listing of a relation R, you have to convert to the distribution mu over the product space, such that when you take the first marginal of mu, so this is uh, denoted by the projection, because it's the first distribution, the second marginal of mu, you get the second distribution, and moreover, Every element in mu with a non-zero probability satisfies R, which is exactly what is meant by uh, this third quantum chain, the, the force of mu increases in R, okay? And uh, so there is something beautiful here, which is hidden, and it took us a very long time to understand, is that this notion is actually very closely related to probabilistic coupling, which is, uh, George knew about it a long time ago, but I didn't know. And uh, so probabilistic coupling is something which is uh, widely used in probability theory to analyze a kind of a relationship between lots of things and also to analyze their convergence. And this is uh, something which we uh, noticed uh, very uh, recently, but it's also very good because it puts our kind of logic on a very good theoretical basis. And what is very important for us is that uh, we have this uh, fundamental lemma which actually says that if your post condition is of a particular shape, which is essentially that uh, E1, which is an event which talks about the first execution, implies E2, which is an event which talks about the second execution. So if you allow, if you manage to establish this relationship with P, uh, a post condition Q of this form, then the probability of E1 in the first execution is going to be smaller than the probability of E2 in the second execution. And uh, this is a fundamental lemma which is kind of different from what people in probabilistic process algebra do because they look at the and interested in the things like Qs and equivalence relations. Uh, but from this lemma you can recover uh, the lemma which is used in probabilistic process algebra and also many lemmas that we will be uh, needing later to reason about cryptography and so on. Okay, and uh, so uh, of course, uh, if you want to do a relational homology probability program, you take the rule of relational homology, but you have to come up with the rule for a random assignment. And the rule for random assignment actually follows directly from the notion of uh, validity. And essentially, it just says if you want to relate two random assignments, you just have to find a copy of them. Okay, so there is not much to say here. But uh, so there are two very nice application of this uh, probabilistic relational homologic one on which we've been working since 2009, which is this proof about security. And then uh, there is this side channel security. So I already mentioned side channel with respect to timing. Uh, here I will mention some work which we did with the side channel relative to um, differential power analysis, which I will explain in a moment, okay? So the basic idea of provable security is that uh, you are, so this is actually what uh, cryptographers do in uh, real life. Um, what you actually have to do is you have a crypto system. So one thing that cryptographers are amazing at is like uh, they actually uh, design system in the way the uh, formal methods people were talking with the building. So they first come with the definition of what they want to achieve and they specify the assumption they're going to use. 
then they construct a system, and then they, they show that their system uh, provided the assumption they're making or value is actually satisfied the point of okay, So then this is the dream for a formal method selection. And uh, so, so speaking as a professor, uh, when the new program came, it is also a dream, but I would like to <laughs> see it true at some point. Yeah, this, is, this is true. But this is actually much better than NPL. This is actually much better than NPL. So essentially what you do is like, you have two probabilistic experiments. The first probabilistic experiment is actually describing um, the property you want to achieve, the construction you are going to use to achieve this functionality at this level of security, okay? And uh, so there is this uh, notion of uh, a winning condition, and winning condition is actually saying uh, under which assumption an adversary that is playing against the crypto system is going to win. And then you have your assumption, which is modeled by some other experiments, the metric due to here. And so essentially you have a hardness assumption because all truth in crypto, or most truth in crypto, eventually boil down to some hardness assumption. And you've got an adversary B, which is playing against this assumption, and it has a winning condition F, okay? And the proof you're going to do is a kind of reductionist argument. And you say, oh, if uh, for every adversary A, so the adversary A is the one playing against the uh, crypto system, uh, there exists an adversary B, which is playing against the harness assumption that has a kind of similar execution time. And if uh, in G1, A wins with overwhelming probability, in G2, B wins with overwhelming probability. And since you assume that this is not possible, it means that this is not possible, okay? So this is how uh, provable cryptography, uh, provable security works. Uh, many years ago, there was a refinement proposed by Delach and Holdaway where they do practice-oriented provable security. So if you think about provable security, the kind of original statement, there is this thing called security parameter, and will, they will be caring about overwhelming probability when the security parameter goes to infinity, which might not be so relevant to practice. So in practice-oriented uh, probability, you actually uh, try to give concrete bounds. Okay, and uh, so now the statement actually remains the same, except, except that rather than reasoning about overwhelming probability implies overwhelming probability, you try to give a concrete inequality that is going to relate the two probabilities. So typically the probability, the, the statement would be other form. The probability of B in G1, so A winning, is going to be uh, smaller than Q times for some expression Q. Uh, the probability of B winning in G2 plus some delta. And the idea is like this has to be small and this has to be small, but you're going to give concrete value. Okay? And so the step which we are making using uh, relational logic is like uh, we are replacing this inequality by a judgment in our logic, okay? And by kind of the fundamental lemma of PRHL, it allows us to fall back to some judgment on inequality and then uh, you just have uh, to do a bit of work because if you look at the conclusion here, I'm talking about two events in the second game, which is kind of F prime and F batch. And essentially F batch corresponds to the probability delta and F prime corresponds to Q times the probability of F. Essentially F prime will be something like there exists an element in the list such that, and the fact that there is this existential uh, will give you uh, this multiplicity factor here, okay? But so what we see is like if you use relational or logic, you get exactly the same kind of guarantee as cryptographers want, except that the way you're going to build your proof is through logic. I mean, usually these two steps are actually pretty easy. Uh, you don't need to worry too much about it, okay? So why would we bother about formalizing crypto proof? And so we started about this in uh, 2004 and we, or five, and we had these two papers by uh, Delac and Holdaway and Shai Halevi that was kind of a call to be applying formal verification uh, to crypto because people felt there were lots of proofs uh, that were incorrect. And uh, when we started, I think one of our earliest objective was this uh, OAP scheme, uh, which is a kind of uh, standard for RSA-based encryption, which was proposed in 94 uh, by uh, Belach and Hogaway, and it's kind of, there are many such stories in crypto, but uh, that's kind of the first uh, story we hit. And uh, so in 2001, 
uh, Shoup actually gave an argument uh, that uh, the proof that they gave uh, in 94 could not be correct. It would not achieve MCCA2 security. And so he proposed a different scheme, a uh, variant of OAP that would achieve MCCA security. At the same time, Fujisaki, Okamoto, Kwanjibana, and Stern, what they did is they actually uh, came up with a different assumption. And under this different assumption, which is still satisfied by uh, RSA, they could actually salvage the proof. Okay, so now you think that everything would be fine. Well, it actually turns out that in 2004, David Kwanjibana published a revised proof of the 2001 paper they had in which he actually filled some holes. We tried very hard to fill some holes here and it uh, was kind of complicated. And so here, the proof was actually a bit different. So if you will try to go and fill holes here, here it will be a bit complicated. So now you think, okay, things are even better. The 2001 proof has been fixed and so on. It actually turns out that in 2009, there was a paper by the lack of finds and kills, which actually say, guys, the security definition that you are targeting is not even clear because there are four possible definitions that are not equivalent. So it turns out that 15 years later, uh, people realized that even the property they wanted to achieve was not very clear. And so in 2011, we came up with a formal proof. So at that time, it was uh, formally verifying the Cox proof of system that uh, actually OAP under uh, the security assumption of set partial domain one way achieved the strongest notion of MCCA. Okay, so just to go very quickly, I don't want to go very much into the detail, but I want to give you a sense of the kind of uh, program we're talking about. And uh, so this is actually uh, the statement of security for OAP. And what should matter to you is that it's actually a very small statement. So here, this is a probabilistic experiment of MCCA2 on the left of the slide, it's uh, okay. And you see it's a kind of straight line code, and you see, so the, the interesting thing is like there is this A1 and A2, and this is how they are adversary. Okay, so from the point of view of formal verification, this adversary are just procedures for which you don't have the code. So that makes it quite a different from the point of view of verification. Uh, so th in the middle, you have the encryption, so if you see the first line of the encryption, it's actually a random sampling, this arrow with a kind of dollar on top. Okay, and then this is all dealing with this string and this alteration about this string. This is not so relevant. And again, on the right, you have the uh, assumption of set possible domain one way. And again, you see that it's a straight line code. And again, so in total, this might be 20 lines of code. It still took 15 years to get this right. So uh, kind of size is not necessarily a good measure of complexity when you do verification. And so here you have this kind of uh, uh, strange polynomials that uh, you come up in the proof. And uh, this is just because a lot of uh, bad statement that uh, you are uh, kind of dealing with, they will actually lead to this constant. This is not so relevant. This is just that you get a flavor of what uh, we try to prove. Okay, so uh, we have a tool that uh, allows you to do this. It's called EasyCrypt, and uh, it's an interactive uh, proof of system that has a proof of engine a SS reflect, and uh, has a lot of backends to uh, SMT solver, computer algebra system, and so on. We used it for a lot of case study. We have one ongoing project with NIST, where we are actually trying to uh, verify their new SHA-3 standards, and uh, we, also using EasyCrypt as a backend for automated uh, and uh, synthesis tool and as a front end for certified compiler. And uh, so we're using a lot of concept. And uh, we have, uh, in addition to the tool based on SMAC, which I pre presented earlier, we have a certified information flow type system for constant time verification in one of the lowest level of concept. Okay, so there is a kind of ecosystem around EasyCrypt um, that we've been using. Now, uh, one of the things which we've been looking at recently and that we are very interested, I'm very interested about is this uh, differential power analysis. So differential power analysis, essentially you're making statistical analysis of power consumption and it allows you to recover the key. And the way you're going to solve this is by uh, doing secret sharing. So you have a value X 
And what you're going to do is like an exit your secret. So you're going to split it into T plus one uh, shares. Okay, and these shares have to satisfy your certain properties. So first of all, these shares are probability. And second, any two shares should be uh, probabilistically independent. Any single share should be uniformly distributed. And then when you take all the shares together and you sum them, you recover the secret. The bottom line is like if you have all the shares minus one, you cannot know anything about it. And uh, so masking is essentially taking an implementation and turning it into an implementation that only manipulates shares. And there is a notion of security for mask implementation. It's called a public model. And uh, so here, essentially, in this model, uh, the adversary can make observation. And observation are just intermediate value. And what the problem security says is like the adversary can pick a set of uh, intermediate observations, so a pick T. And what he will get the result. But uh, the results he gets actually depend on less than three share of each input. Okay, so it thinks there is at most at least one share missing from each input, you won't learn a thing about the secret. And this is really cool because this is a notion of probability non interference. And you might think it's a crazy model, but in 2014, uh, Jim Zimbowski and Fox, they got the best paper forward of Europe is by showing that this probability model, which looks a very theoretical model, is actually equivalent uh, in the cryptographer sense that you have reduction to a practical model called noisy leakage. Okay, but so now this is really cool because we can use probabilistic non-interference to analyze differential power analysis. And uh, so here is an example of a very simple, simple, simple program. Uh, it's actually uh, doing multiplication at order two. Okay, and what you see, uh, what it is doing is like a, so a is just divided into a zero, a one, and a two. B is divided into b zero, b one, b two. And what this program is actually doing is like it's actually doing compulsory multiplication on the shares, and then with a uh, uniformly sampling some values in the, some finite field, and then doing some computation to return a fresh one. Okay, this is just uh, to give you a flavor of the kind of programs we're talking about. Okay, and so what we actually managed to do is like uh, verify probability security of this thing. And the basic idea here is like if you want to prove probabilistic non-interference, what you have to do is actually exhibit a bijection that relates the sampling in one program and the sampling in the other program. And once you have done this, the only thing which you have to check is like deterministic uh, property in a relational whole logic under the assumption that x1 and x2, which are the variables that are sampled in the universe, uh, in the sorry, probabilistic program, are related by this bijection F that uh, you've been uh, suggesting. Okay, so in, uh, in order to verify probabilistic non-interference, what you do is like come up with a, a bijection and verify uh, properties on two deterministic programs. And we have actually built something uh, to do this. So we have a tool which is called NLT Verif. Uh, don't ask me why it's called NLT, I don't know. And uh, so essentially one of the problems with this is like you have to verify probabilistic non-interference for all sets of five RTPs. And there can be a lot of sets. So if you look here, for example, at order of three, it's two billion sets. You're not going to do this. This is not going to work. So we have a trick, which is really once I come up with the dijection, I try to find the biggest set for which I can prove non-interference using this dijection. And it allows us to actually consider much fewer sets. Okay, and that actually scales very well. And so we're kind of beating flatly all cryptographers on this. Uh, I mean, okay, there are practical cryptographers, so they're actually publishing conferences like Chess, as you see. I mean, there is no paper in crypto, but there is a community that is really devoted to this. And they have a hard time coming up with constructions that are secure. And uh, we beat them flatly because we have an automated tool and we can do a lot of things. And then the other problem they have is like these guys are, don't have the right tool to do composition. And in fact, they don't have the right tool because their notion of non-interference is non-compositional. But uh, we came up with the notion of uh, some non-interference, which is actually compositional, which is actually verified by many of the existing gadgets, and uh, which can actually be used as a foundational building block for an uh, information flow type system, which is just doing information flow with the cardinality constraint, and uh, that allows us to do efficient kind of uh, uh, 
uh, arbitrary order. So there is a new S agency with C methods, for example, which is uh, paying some people to develop mass implementation of, let's say, um, spec or Simon, which are from a uh, algorithm which they have uh, proposed, and say, oh, please build me an implementation at order three. Actually, we have a source to source transformation that just does this fully automatically and at arbitrary order. So that's pretty cool. Okay. And uh, so that's actually something which we are very, very excited about. Uh, the other thing which we've been uh, very active is uh, try to uh, uh, look at the generalization of CMHL where we actually have a quantitative generalization. So we don't expect the force condition to hold exactly, but we hope, we hope that the force condition holds, holds up to some quantitative relaxation. And uh, so we have this uh, uh, approximate probabilistic relational hall logic, uh, which is the same as before, except now judgments are indexed by uh, two real values, epsilon and delta. And uh, we have a generalization of the notion of Lipsky uh, for this notion. So it's a bit different in the sense that you have now two witnesses, while for PRHL you have a single witness. But there is still a fundamental theorem that holds, and this fundamental theorem says, oh, if my first condition is again an implication between two events, then the, if I look at the probability of E1 in the first game, it's going to be smaller than exponential of epsilon, probability of E2 in the second game plus delta, okay? And uh, so this is something which is very useful for one particular property, which is called uh, differential privacy, which I will show on my next slide, but also it extends to uh, arbitrary other, or well, not arbitrary, but many other F divergence. F divergence is just a notion of Something which induces a notion of distance on probability distribution, and it includes uh, relative entropy, uh, Hellinger distance, and so on. And actually, we recently had a paper at CCS this year where we actually use this generalization to have divergence for differentially sided uh, variations for them. Okay, so uh, back to differential uh, privacy. The basic idea of uh, differential privacy, so I don't have too much time, so I will go uh, very fairly quickly. But essentially, uh, you want to do a, a kind of a privacy preserving uh, uh, computation over sensitive data. And the way you're going to do this is uh, essentially by adding noise to computation. And again, uh, differential privacy was motivated or was inspired by work in crypto. So what people did is actually they first came up with a definition and then mechanism that satisfies the definition and then proved that this mechanism actually satisfies the definition. And what you want to guarantee with differential privacy is like um, you want to guarantee a single individual that is participation or non-participation in a database will have a limited impact on the result of a query. Okay, and uh, so I'm missing the red line here, but uh, actually what you have is like two databases, one where uh, the subject is in, one where the subject is out. You feed in the two sets of databases to uh, the same query, and what you want is like you want to get probability distribution that look very much like each other. So you have to imagine the red line because it has disappeared for some reason. So you want like the ratio between the two is very bounded. So the kind of two distributions are equal. And this is formalized by this definition here, which is essentially saying that your uh, algorithm is epsilon delta very differentially private with respect to some adjacency relation phi. Uh, if whenever you start with two uh, databases that are related by phi, uh, the probability that uh, the result belongs to a set S in the first execution is actually upper bounded by exponential of epsilon, the probability that the second result belongs to S plus delta, and this for all sets S. Okay, but which is exactly what we had a setup before, and in fact, you can prove that a mechanism is epsilon delta differentially private if you can actually show in this uh, approximate relational whole logic that this judgment is valid, where K1 and K2, remember, are just the two copies we are making by tagging values differently. And uh, so what is very nice 
uh, from the fact that we uh, know we are dealing with coupling is like it gives us new proof principles uh, to reason about differential privacy and this really gives us an edge about other people who do differential privacy with pen and paper proof and so uh, traditionally differential privacy says okay you have two values that are different you add sufficient probabilistic noise and you make them look equal which is exactly what the rule on the top is saying okay now taking inspiration for a notion called shift coupling you can actually do something dual you say oh i start from two equal things and i pay okay i mean there is a notion of privacy budget in differential privacy and by paying you make them look different which is exactly what this rule is saying here so i start from two value e1 and e2 that are equal i put noise on each of them and what i get is like get two results which are separated by k okay and uh, so this is very cool because now you can actually play between these two rules and uh, this allow gives you a lot of leverage and then there is this pointwise equality rule which actually corresponds to a swap of quantifier uh, like uh, for all there exists where exists for all and also gives us a lot of leverage but um, I will not go into the detail of this now uh, using this we've been able to prove one algorithm which is called sparse vector and uh, again this is a very simple algorithm essentially what it's doing is like uh, uh, I have a threshold you uh, send me values and uh, I will return you values which are above this threshold the first 10 values which are above this threshold okay now the magic of this is like in differential privacy uh, every time you call one of this mechanism you pay now it's sparse vector you don't really pay for all the time you call just pay for, for every time you get something above threshold so that's the kind of magic okay and uh, we have this example here that people got wrong many times uh, the variance we present here when we talk to people who are experts in differential privacy they didn't actually know whether it would be true or not and now thanks to our program logic we actually have very simple proof of this and it's quite a difficult example because it uses notions such as advanced composition, uh, accuracy dependent privacy and optimal subset coupling, whatever this means. Um, these are actually quite uh, difficult things to get to, but uh, again, coupling works for all of them. And so if you look at this, uh, this is just a taken from a paper which is actually surveying this sparse vector technique and uh, it's kind of ironical because last year there was a survey on sparse vector and the guy said look at all these things they're all wrong and the first survey was also wrong so there is a second survey that fixes the first survey and actually does things right and again so we have a kind of edge with what we are doing because uh, we have this uh, logic which uh, gives you a very structural way to do proof and it's kind of fairly simple uh, once you have to structure a way to get things through okay now um, we have some ongoing work uh, which is more related to uh, um, reasoning about convergence of Markov chain so the only thing which I should say it's kind of a proof relevant version of PRHL and we use it for analyzing convergence of Markov chain but I also believe it has a lot of interesting uh, proof theoretical implication because up to now in PRHL you're assuming the existence of a witness in proof relevant PRHL you're actually building the witness and this gives you much more leverage when you are going to try to prove the meta theory of your logic okay and so we have some nice application of this uh, including convergence of Markov chain which I will not present because I'm running slightly late so uh, let me try to uh, conclude so a lot of the work that we've been doing has been uh, addressing kind of um, language-based technique for provable security and differential privacy and what I like a lot about this work is like it's not only giving a kind of good foundation but it's also practical we have built a system and you can use it to verify uh, actually state-of-the-art or quasi state-of-the-art crypto okay which is very good and also state-of-the-art or quasi state-of-the-art differential privacy so we can actually take real recent papers from the literature and verify them and uh, I think where we get a real edge is also that our results can be 
translated to real world security of low level implementation. If you're a cryptographer, your life is hard enough in trying to analyze a scheme. If the next day people say, no, no, but I don't like your stuff with an pseudo code, I want the same guarantees for x86 implementation, I mean, this is not possible uh, if you don't have tools. And because we have these tools and we have connection with certified compilers and we have static analysis that allows us to reason on code, we can actually go all the way down. So um, this is some very, uh, something which is very good. I don't claim that we will solve uh, all the problems of cryptography because, I mean, there is this very nice saying from cryptographers which say, uh, all our models are constructed. Okay, and so of course for us, if we have a model of x86, it will be a constructed model because nobody knows what x86 is doing in practice. If we have a model of leakage of x86, our model of leakage is also constructed because nobody knows the power consumption of uh, using, I mean, there are people like Reinhard Willem in uh, South Africa, they spend their life doing this and they are very happy because they get an approximation within 15% like for this notion of non-interference, we need to have the exact thing, which is just out of reach. So what we have is guarantees for contracted models, but much better than what provable security is doing. So for future direction, we would like to extend our stuff to large scale crypto system. So there is this voting company in Spain with whom we are collaborating and we, try, we want to try to verify their uh, voting protocols. There's a lot of work to be done uh, using uh, around the technologies which we are using to make them practical. So for example, we're using certified compiler, but you know, if you're a cryptographer, uh, you really like like Peter Schwabe or Dan Bernstein, you really like to code to run fast on any kind of platform. And currently uh, certified compilers don't do this. So there's a lot of work to be done in this direction. Uh, one thing which uh, we also try to do uh, is uh, like uh, to synthesize a crypto uh, construction. So two years ago at the run session at the Crypto uh, 2014, we announced that we would like uh, to get uh, Jens uh, out of a job and uh, replace, it, uh, replace him sorry, by a program that automatically generates uh, a new crypto construction. We have not managed yet, but we'll keep on trying. <laughs> and uh, and uh, then uh, we would like to do some, uh, uh, maybe now he should be worried to go on holidays tomorrow. <laughs> 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 and uh, <laughs> and uh, we would also like to do some work in the direction of uh, automating uh, proofs in differential privacy because there is this trade-off between privacy and accuracy and maybe you can kind of uh, automatically generate the best trade-off. Um, and uh, there is this uh, thing which I find uh, fascinating and I know very little about but uh, Jean knew about it many years ago, which is this path coupling, and this is also something which I would be uh, very interested in uh, trying to uh, study more as a means to uh, analyze uh, convergence of Markov chains. Thanks for your attention. Yeah,